got your Bibles, let's go to John chapter 4, verse 31. John chapter 4, verse 31. <clears throat> and in the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. They said unto them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Therefore, says disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? Jesus said unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Say not ye, there are four, yet four months, and then come of harvest. But I say unto you, Lift up your eyes and look unto the fields, for they are white already to harvest. He that reapeth, reapeth wages, and gather fruit unto eternal life, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap, wherein you bestow no labor. Other men labored, and you entered into their labors. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Father, for this night, this day. I ask you, Father, anoint my lips of clay, anoint the ears, ears to hear, in Jesus' name, amen. Title of my message, What in the World is a Christian, the church, supposed to do? you got to realize this portion of Scripture was, was written right after Jesus, or based on the incident, right after Jesus led. A very wicked woman to him. Amen. This verse is about, you know, and look at there are yet four months, and then come of harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they're white already to harvest. I believe we are in an hour where the church is prerogative, and it's always been to evangelize. The Bible says. Mark chapter 16, 15, 16 says, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes is baptized shall be saved. He who believes not shall be damned. Acts 1 8 says, Ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and Judea, and Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. I believe. We need to care for the lost. Do we really care for the lost like we do? I need to care more. I was one time a very wicked sinner. People used to call me hippie chippy. That's how bad a man I was. But thank God there was enough people to care for hippie chippy. To reach him. And I thank God for those people. I can name some right now. Main one I like to name is Mama Joyce Stewart, a legally blind black lady from Jamaica. I still call her on Mother's Day. There's other people. There's a guy I went to high school with, Curtis Howler. I think now deceased. He done a great work trying to reach me. Amen. Even though I don't think he said much to me, I'm going to name a man here, John Hart. His living his life before me really helped. Tonight, what are we doing? What are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to reach out? Or are we supposed to let them come our way? I am noticing something. We're in an hour. If we wait for them to come, they're not going to come. Amen. So we got to get up. Why must the church put evangelism first? Well, number one, the Bible says, for all have sinned. And have come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Romans 6.23 And death is not physical death. For both the saints and the sinners will die. You know that's an appointment we all got. The Bible says that as is appointed unto men. Once to die after this. The judgment. I got the appointment. I'm surprised. Another thing. I believe in Jesus coming. I believe he could come any day now. Amen. I believe in the rapture. I believe pre-tribulationism. I'm not here to fault my mid-trib, post-trib, or, or pre-wrath brethren. I have friends in all those camps, and there's some other camps. In fact, some of them are my best friends. Disagree with me on that. So I'm not out to hurt any of them. In fact, I'll tell you what, I made a rule. When I go to their pulpits, 
I will not preach the pre-trib rapture. I won't preach the mid-trib rapture. I won't preach the pre-wrath rapture. I won't preach the post-trib rapture. I will just talk about the second coming of Christ, which is the thing we all believe, and we all believe in the soon second coming of Christ. Believe me, if I read Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 17, 26 to 33, Read Luke chapter 21. Read 2 Timothy chapter 3. Also, 1 Timothy chapter 4, 1 through 6. I often forget that one. 2 Timothy chapter 4, 1 through 5. And Revelation chapter 3, 14 to 22. They all say one thing. Jesus is coming! Oh, you say, oh, now, Brother Roy, it's always been that way. Let me tell you. No, it hasn't. There's always been, those, there's been, always been sin and stuff like that going on daily. But you did not hear about it. I believe that is a prophecy in part when Jesus said all those and when it was written that there's going to be a mass communication in this day and age. You know, there was a time it took many days for news to get from one part of the country to another. Now, I'm talking back in Jesus' days. Now, something could happen in Australia could happen in India, could happen in uh, Czechoslovakia, could happen in uh, Russia, and we can know about in matters of seconds. Jesus knew that it was going to happen. Why should we put evangelism? Because of the lost soul of man. Every Like when we see these men marching, and I ate gay praise, it's gay shame praise. I refuse to call it pride. Though in one sense it is, because the Bible says pride goes before destruction, a high spirit before a fall. And yes, they're heading for a fall, and they're bringing this nation down. But this is what I already tell you. Every time they get up, they're saying loss, loss, loss. All the trashy rock and roll music, every time they hit those strings, they're saying loss, loss, loss. Can I tell you something? What's even sadder? Right before me, I have this story about this uh, Dr. Ray Upston. He was standing at a church in Dayton, Ohio, years ago. As a member of the church, we're leaving. He asked everybody one question as he shook hands. Are you a Christian? He should have said, are you saved? Are you been born again? Just ahead, there was this gray-haired lady. When he questioned her, she indignantly replied, Doc, Why, Dr. Opson, I've been a member of this church since I was a little girl. My father and mother are members of this church. Dr. Upson said quietly, I did not ask if you were a church member. I asked if you were a Christian. She angrily turned on her heel and left the church. Can I tell you something tonight? Even in our churches, it don't matter whether you're Pentecostal, Baptist, Brethren, it don't matter whether you're a non-denominationalist, an interdenominationalist. It don't matter whether you're neo-evangelical, emergent church, old-time holiness. There's a lot of our members who are not saved now. I believe it with all my heart. It's not the church door that gets you to heaven. It's Jesus. Amen. Amen. It's not whether you're an, an evangelical or a fundamentalist or holiness. It's whether you know Jesus. Today! That's why I believe we need to be evangelizing. The Bible says, by the way, back to that issue, church, he'll be saved, lost in church. John 3 was written about the most, was, when it was written, was, when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, the most devout man in Israel in that day and age. What did he say? He said, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except the man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He said again, verily, verily, verse 5, verily, verily, I say unto you, except you be born of the water of the Spirit, you can't enter the kingdom of God. Verse 7, marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again to the most devout religious Pharisee of the day, the one that was without even trying to destroy Jesus, but the one that wanted to hear his words. He was lost. Thank God, I believe Nicodemus did get saved. Why should we put evangelism first? I'll tell you why. It's because above anything else, God wants people to be saved. I do not believe in hyper-Calvinism. 
I believe in the free will man. The only thing I tell them whenever I tell them I'm Arminian, I do not believe a person could just be saved anytime they want to. Only as the Spirit of God draws. As long as the Spirit of God's speaking, you have a chance that once the Spirit withdraws, you're in trouble. Today, if the Spirit of God is dealing with you, sinner, and maybe you're listening, don't put off salvation. Death is certain. The second coming of Christ is certain. And you don't know when the Lord said you've sinned too far. Now, I've met people who say they've sinned too far. They haven't. But I still believe that today you better not be putting it off. The Lord wants the men to be saved. As it says, as I live, saith the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It's not His will. Whenever you say no to Him, it's your will. God wants you to be saved. And if He's dealing with you, don't put it off. By the way, we often quote that verse, what, amen, he, Hebrews 2, 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? That's actually lit, written to the church, by the way. That was apostatized and not to the believer, unbeliever, I mean. But can I tell you something? That's true. How shall we you escape if you do neglect a great salvation sinner, man? Backslider. And one more thing I want to ask the Christians. How are the sinners going to escape if we neglect reaching them? we got to reach them. we got to reach them. Amen. That's a pur God's purpose and plan for each and every life. Did you know something? God wants every one of us. Not just the preachers. Yes, I'm a preacher. I believe in trying to reach out. I like to start doing some street preaching. I like to get more tracks and hand them out. I love Chick Tracks, by the way, in case my friend from Chick Publications here, I think you've got the best. I love it. I love the fact you're King James. I love it, the fact that you really emphasize repentance. And I believe you've got the best. Some of them are funny. Some of them are serious. But they do get the message done. A lot of times I can hand out others, but Chick's nine out of ten times will be read. Amen. Amen. But anyway, I believe tonight we need to reach out to, that's our purpose. The Bible says that we're to go in the highways and hedges and to compel them to come in. Now by compel doesn't mean force. As I've often heard said, a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. And you can't force anybody to be saved. I heard this story though one time. It's, they say this is true. There was a man, he was a sinner. They said these two big burly Christians went up to him and they picked him up. They took him to church. And they, he, with the altar calls given, they made sure he got to the altar and he prayed through the whole time salvation. And at the time he, uh, he was testifying, he said, I never did backslide. I'll tell you, that may be one isolated incident. But most of the time that ain't going to work. A man convinced against his wills of the same opinion still. I believe tonight it's not compel in a sense by force. It's compel in the sense that we know what our message is about. Number one, it's a message of life and death. Or should I rather say heaven and hell? Because we know there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. And we need to compel them because we realize how serious the hell really is. I believe there really is a real hell. It's eternal. And I do not believe once they're down there that they ever will perish in the sin. They perish in the sense that they will suffer torments day and night forever and more. Read Revelation chapter 14. 9 through 11, it's clear cut that when you, a sinner dies, all oh, I said, they want them taking the mark of the beast. If you never get to serve Jesus, you might as well say you got the mark of the beast on you, regardless whether you take it or not. But tonight, if you don't know Jesus, you're heading for hell. It's a life and death message. That's what it's trying to say. We need to have the compelling. In our heart. Amen. God's that's his purpose. One time a disgusted. A disgusted youth said to a pastor. These Christians make me sick. 
They say they have the greatest news in the world, but they don't tell it. I believe we need to tell. I'm preaching this to me as much as to you all. Upon whom does God depend to do the work of the evangelism? He depends on his church. I believe the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It says in Hebrews 4.12. I believe the word of God is a living book. It's not dead. It's not living in a sense it's going to change. No, it is it's it's solid in the fact it's never going to change. The Bible says in Leviticus 18.22, it's an abomination for a man, life mankind as it does with a womankind. He'll say, now why are you always hitting homosexuals? I'll tell you why. I, 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 hit, I preach against adultery. I preach against drunkenness. I preach against drug use. But how many of them are marching down the streets showing their pride in that? And then you study Genesis 19. It's clear that's the sin that destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. It's still an abomination and always will be. You love the homosexual enough to reach him. You love the adulterer enough to reach him. God's dependent on us. Can he depend on you? I'll tell you what I like about this story. In Genesis chapter I mean, John chapter 4. This lady just met the Lord. She just got gloriously saved. I don't know what happened to the man. I'm sure he packed his bags and left Samaria fast. (laughs) Because you can't live together outside marriage. That's called fornication. Marriage is honorable and all in the bed undefiled. The whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. I believe with all my heart she had to get out of that, that affair she was in. People say, well, Brother Roy, I've been living together with such and such a lady for so many years. You think I should marry her? I will say neither yes nor no until I know the circumstances. I'll leave it there because I don't want to cloud the issue. But we got to be the one dependent on. Can the Lord depend on us? I'm not just talking to you all. I'm talking to me. I like it when I preach. I'm encouraged. Like when I preach messages of encouragement. And I find myself encouraged. and feel like I got a little extra energy to go on. I love that. I also like it when the Lord speaks to me while I'm preaching. You need to do the same. I believe we need to love the sinner enough to reach out. What reward will we get for it? You know, first off, I'm going to say something. Regardless whether I get any rewards or not, I'm going to try reaching souls. Regardless whether I get any rewards or not, I'm going to try living the best I can for the Lord and serving with all my heart. Heaven's sufficient for me. I believe being in heaven will be sufficient. But you know what? There are crowns it talks about. It talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 about wood, hay, stubble, gold, silver, and precious stones. I want my life to be gold, precious, silver, and precious stones. So today, we should be seeking the Lord and trying to reach as many souls as we can. Because I believe we're in an hour. If we're not, I'll tell you how I feel. I'd rather get to heaven and have nothing but but wood, hay, and stubble for my reward and be there and go to hell and have no reward and have the reward of a, the wages of an ungodly life. But regardless, it says here, he that soweth receiveth rages, and he that gathereth fruit unto eternal life. Both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. I'll tell you, there will be a reward. Here is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap therein, whereon you bestow no labor, 
Other men labored, and ye entered into their labors. I want the rewards I'm going to get. But my main goal is to please the Lord and get to heaven. If I don't get a great crown, that's okay. Just being with Jesus is good enough. And to see and there's some souls there that could say, it was Chip's influence. It was Chip's testimony. It was Chip's preaching. It was his Chip's zeal. It was Chip's love for the Lord that got me here. Today, what is the world, what is the church supposed to do? It's supposed to evangelize. Are we doing what we can for the souls of men? Please, Senator, one more thing, Christians. Don't be critical of those who do. Years ago, I saw a certain lady somewhere in America. <laughs> Do something in the name of reaching souls. I did not like what she was doing. I really didn't. But I like what the Lord spoke to me after I saw her. He said, Don't you criticize her until you've been out actively reaching souls for two weeks. He really spoke that to me. I know when I was a young convert, people got on me for my religious zeal. I'll, I'll even go this far one time, a Bible study, and I'm going to be up front with you. They rebuked me for the wrong thing. I deserved the rebuke. I deserved a worse rebuke than what I got. Woo! But they rebuked me wrongly. They were saying, you didn't have love. You need to have more love. I had love for that soul that I was a little offend, I, I handled wrong. I don't want to discuss what I did. I'm still embarrassed 40 years later. <laughs> Can I tell you something? It wasn't lack of love. I had great love for that person. The problem was I was not, I was being too zealous and not wise. That done me more harm spiritually than it ever done me good. I'm going to tell you something tonight. I believe we need to reach out. So you say, I'm just going to reach through my life. Well, great. I believe in living a consistent Christian life. The Bible says what I and not the Bible, pardon me. No, no, that's wrong. <laughs> the Bible doesn't say this, pardon me. That was a slip. But they often have said, this is it. What you do. Speak so loud, I can't hear what you say. If we're going to walk, the, if we're going to talk the duck talk, we better walk the walk. So today, yes, I believe we need to live a consistent Christian life. Listen to the criticism the preachers give. Listen to the just criticism we get. Like I said, that was not right because they said I was not walking in love. I was walking in love. I was just being too zealous and not wise. Be careful when you rebuke a Christian for being overzealous. Don't say they didn't have love. They probably love that sinner more than you did. I don't know why I'm saying this. But today, let's reach out. The hour is short. The day is at hand. As it says, Say not ye, there are yet four months of income of harvest. Behold, I say unto you, Lift up your eyes and look unto the hills, for they are white already under harvest. If you wait, it may be too late. Let's get out of our four walls. Reach out to them. God bless you.